talk to you today. It's my great pleasure to address you on ADHD in children. And this is even though I'm actually, Chantal, change the slide, please. Even though I am an adult psychiatrist, um, Chantal, we need the next slide, please. That's great. So here we are. I'm a, a psychiatrist who works only with adults. I'm a researcher. And I work at a clinic that is dedicated to treating ADHD in adults in the Netherlands and The Hague. We also have an expertise center where we are doing all sorts of research on ADHD. So my work combines research and clinical care. So Chantal, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do really today in the time that we have is I'm going to give you a short history of ADHD in children. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how commonly it seems. I'll talk to you about the prevalence. Uh, I'll tell you a little about the symptoms and the consequences. I can't resist slipping in a slide on ADHD in girls. Chantal has already alluded to that. Go back, Chantal, please. Um, because ADHD in girls is, uh, is something that is often neglected and the symptoms present quite differently. I'm going to give you some neurochemical information on what happens at the synapse, so what is happening in the nervous system for people with ADHD. I'll talk to you about treatment options and then what happens when ADHD is not treated in children, what can happen later on. Okay, so let's move. Let's talk about some history and perhaps one of the earliest examples of hyperactivity is found in a painting by a Dutch artist called Jan Steen and it's called The Village School and it was painted in about 1670. So let's look at this painting. And uh, a pity, but because normally I have some animations, I think they've been lost because Chantal had to take over the, 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 the sides. But basically what you see at the back in blue is a boy standing on the desk. So he is in this very chaotic classroom. He seems to be uh, ADHD. I mean, he's not even sitting in his chair. We have the teacher who is uh, in a red circle paring his nails. We have a boy on the uh, the right hand side of the screen offering a pair of glasses to an owl and in the 17th century owls were in fact symbols of ignorance and stupidity unlike today so it's a bit of a futile exercise to give glasses to an owl and on the left of uh, the canvas you can see two girls who in fact appear to be focusing well and the only ones just about in this classroom who are doing their work because there's some boys at the back Fighting and there's a boy sleeping, which relates to sleep disorders and ADHD. So basically from this painting, we have quite a nice overview of, the, of, of a chaotic classroom where ADHD children are present and are not being treated. So let's go to the next slide, please. Good. Okay, so in terms of the history of ADHD, um, in fact, ADHD is not a new condition. Many people think it's something of the 20th century, but that's not true at all was described in the medical literature, in fact, in the last century. And even before that, the director of a psychiatric hospital called Heinrich Hoffmann describes inattention and hyperactivity. You see a picture of him here. And not only did he do that, but he also wrote a book that some of you might have heard of called Struvel Peter. Let's look at the next slide. And this book, in fact, is a warning to children not to misbehave. It illustrates all sorts of disobedient and naughty behaviors of children. And some of them really rese resemble ADHD. So here's a child who hasn't cut his nails, who hasn't brushed or cut his hair. And all these children described in the Struble Peter have terrible ends, but also get up to all sorts of mischief. So it's a kind of a very harsh uh, expose of, of, of children who perhaps have unacceptable behaviors and there's a strong moral message. That of course is not the way we see ADHD at all. We see ADHD as um, a neurodevelopmental problem actually um, and people cannot be punished for their symptoms. We've moved very far from that 19th century idea. So go on Chantal. Here we have the story of Fidgety Philip 
and it translated into English, it said, but Philip, he did not mind his father, who was so kind. He wriggled and giggled, and then I declared, swam backward and forward and tilted his chair. And as you can see from this image, he actually rips off the tablecloth and everything. The whole meal comes crashing to the floor. So this is an example of a child who's hyperactive, impulsive, and as a result creates chaos in his home environment and his father is no longer kind but in fact extremely angry with him okay next slide so let's look a bit at the prevalence of adhd how often we see it in the population next slide chantal okay so it's about six percent of children and adolescents and three percent of adults, but also of older adults. So in our clinic, we have no end point to treatment. So we start treatment at the age of 18. So we see only adults. But in fact, um, some of those adults are in their 80s or in their 90s. In most cases, ADHD results from a combination of genetic and environmental risks. And there seem to be small differences in the brains uh, between those with and without ADHD. Now, I'm afraid there's been a bit of a, uh, a bit of a blurring of some of my words at the bottom, but basically what that means is that when we do scans of children and adults with ADHD, we see that the, the maturation of certain brain areas is slower in children with ADHD, and that's part of the reason it's a neurodevelopmental condition, it's something that starts in childhood and is present, present during the lifespan, but also if you measure the size of certain structures in the brain, they are a little smaller uh, in people with ADHD. Let's move on to the next slide. So to go through the symptoms and their consequences, let's move to the next slide. We're gonna start, to go back Chantal, please. Yes, there's a triad of three types of symptoms. There's inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. So that's what we see in ADHD. And starting with inattention, let's see the next slide. Inattention itself is a triad of three types of problems. The first one is difficulty focusing. The second one is difficulty with planning. And the third one is trouble with time management. And we see this in children and we see this in adults. So move on, Chantal, please. If we look at the diagnostic manual, which is what psychiatrists use in the US particularly, but it's very similar in, uh, in the UK where they have another diagnostic manual called the ICD, but they're very similar. If you look at the inattention symptoms, there are things like not being able to give attention to details and making careless mistakes or struggling to follow instructions. Instructions need to be repeated for children. They start with a task, but they don't finish it. They're easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. They're forgetful. They will avoid tasks that require prolonged concentration. You get the feeling as an adult or as another child, when you're speaking to a child with ADHD, they're not listening to you when you're speaking to them directly. And they have difficulty organizing themselves, so their room might be chaotic, their school bag might be chaotic, and they often lose possessions, which is very hard and expensive for parents because sorry that was a, a technical issue that was never happened to me before <laughs> but uh, suddenly I had a hyperactive headset okay um, okay Chantal let's move on to the next slide please okay so in terms of inattention the attention span is short they are distracted not only by external factors like noise but also by their own thoughts so they can be distracted internally they lose focus in conversation they can be chaotic they don't finish tasks and they arrive late i want to apologize for the slides that uh, where the lettering has been a bit shifted i think we had to make it uh, less uh, detailed in order to upload it on this particular site so i just want to tell you that usually my sites have animation and they also are well structured but anyway having given that little explanation let me continue so in terms of inattention the planning and organization are poor 
And by that, I mean that people need too much time to complete tasks or they have difficulty starting and finishing tasks. They'll procrastinate and avoid getting started. They're not motivated. And in fact, they, it seems to take them enormous amount of efforts to do tasks that other people find very easy. So like one example would be multitasking. That's very hard. Okay. In terms of um, inattention, I want to mention that some people with ADHD and children as well will describe hyperfocus, which means intense focus for particular periods of time. And this is when the task is highly salient. In other words, something that they feel passionately interested in. They can stay focused for long periods of time, longer than people without ADHD. But it's very hard for people with ADHD to control when they hyperfocus. So if it's a boring task, they're not going to be able to do it. Continuing with inattention, there's the issue of mind wandering, which is typical of ADHD. Um, thoughts sort of seem to drift from one topic to the other, or mental restlessness. Sometimes they will describe having unrelated, spontaneous thoughts that just pop into their head and they describe their minds as being constantly on the go or jumping from topic to topic. Now, all of this experience this. Uh, it's not specific to ADHD, but it can be very dominant in ADHD. Other people with ADHD describe multiple thoughts at the same time and what we call associative thinking. So one thought will spark another thought. So the consequences of untreated inattention is having to reread information, for example, reading a text five times and then just not remembering what you've read. Or people describe that they feel like TV with 10 channels on at the same time. So, so much distraction. And others will describe them as being unmotivated or lazy. But this is, in fact, completely untrue. For children with ADHD to do something, it in fact takes a lot more energy, so they're not lazy at all. Other consequences of ADHD are feeling different, ashamed, guilty, um, yeah, struggling with mistakes, um, feeling a failure. And as I've said to you, things just take much longer. It takes you much more effort if your ADHD is untreated to achieve similar results. So when I talk about focus, let's focus on focus. There are different types of focus. First of all, to be able to concentrate or focus, you need to be able to initiate your focus. So start listening, for example, to a conversation. Now, sometimes that first step is impossible for people with ADHD when it's untreated. Second of all, you've got to be able to sustain your focus. So in the example of a conversation, keep listening and not getting distracted by the door that slammed or this bird that sang outside. You also have to be able to stop focusing, which means that at an appropriate time, you end the conversation. You don't go on and on and on. Then the fourth aspect is returning to focus. So there might be someone who interrupts you, asks you a question, but you have to be able to regain the thread then you might need to change your focus. Suddenly, the person you're speaking with might raise another topic and you need to be able to switch topics and not simply hammer on the initial topic you were discussing. And finally, sometimes you have to put up a screen and switch off your focus, which means in a room where there are other conversations happening, you're not wanting to listen to other people's conversations. So without filters, your brain is simply a jumble. Part of ADHD, part of the problems in ADHD is not having the appropriate filters. Okay, we've dealt with the first part of the triad, which is inattention. Now we're going to turn to the second part, which is hyperactivity. Okay, so hyperactivity is easy to recognize. And this is because people who are hyperactive are as if they have little motors inside, they have difficulty, have difficulty sitting still, they'll talk excessively, they'll talk loudly, they'll blurt out answers, they struggle to control themselves, they push themselves to go further. So that's also an aspect of hyperactivity. Um, next slide. Yeah, there's also this issue of what we call inner restlessness. So particularly in adults, but sometimes in children, as well, and particularly girls, you might not see external hyperactivity, but it's more internalized. 
But people who are hyperactive can often be clumsy. They knock things because they're moving excessively. They struggle to unwind. They're always on the go. On the phone, they may pace up and down. I've mentioned talking loudly and talking and talking and talking. Sometimes it's hard to do your homework or to hold down an office-bound job. They might fidget and rock. They complain that when they sit still, the strains their muscles and they can't switch off their thoughts at night. So many people with ADHD and children included struggle to fall asleep at night. So I mentioned the inner restlessness. I want to come back to this. The symptoms of ADHD are not static. They change during the lifespan. So let's take a boy with ADHD. As he becomes a teenager, he might become less hyperactive, less physically hyperactive, or his motor hyperactivity will decrease. And it becomes replaced by subjective feelings of restlessness. And there are four factors, but it's mostly a mental restlessness with distractibility, your own thoughts distract you, that you switch from topic to topic, you cognitively impulsive, and you describe this kind of disorganization in your thoughts. Now think about this DSM-5 criterion, runs about or climbs in situations where it's not appropriate. When the DSM describes what happens with adolescents, it says they may be limited to feeling restless. And this is, of course, true for adults. There's a lot of inner restlessness. So people talk about losing their train of thought while they're talking, and that's one of the reasons they may blurt out, because they're scared to forget what they're about to say. They struggle to organize their own thoughts. The thoughts race through their minds. They can't fall asleep because of mental agitation, and their thoughts appear to be this chaotic jumble. So if you do not treat hyperactivity, it can sort of become diverted into ruminating or excessive worrying. People can never react, relax. They're therefore very tense. They might be rejected by their peers because they're just too intense physically and, and in social context. And therefore, they might feel very lonely. They might do excessive amounts of sport and develop injuries. Or they might, as they're teenagers or adults, use alcohol or drugs or eat cannabis to calm down, relax, or fall asleep. The third part of the triad is impulsivity. So there's the inattention part, and then there's a kind of combination of hyperactivity and impulsivity. But let me describe the impulsivity. It's people who act without thinking. They blurt, they're tactless, they struggle to wait for their turn because they're impatient, and they might also show impulsive behavior with spending, with drugs, with sex. Children with ADHD will start using drugs or smoking if they are untreated two years earlier than their peers. Is there perhaps an evolutionary benefit of impulsivity? And that's probably true because um, it's good in a dangerous situation to be able to react very rapidly in a sort of impulsive way. Having a quick response to danger is in fact beneficial. And many people who are highly impulsive will have a good career saving lives perhaps like Chantal's son, who's going to study medicine and perhaps be an emergency medicine specialist. They also often have preference for working under stress, like in the army, police, fire brigade, first aid or sports. Okay, so let's talk about emotional dysregulation. This is not in the triad and it's not described in the DSM, but it's a very important component of ADHD. It's been well studied and described in ADHD. Okay, next slide. Go back one, please. Yeah, so as I said, it's not listed in the DSM, but it occurs in up to 90% of people. And what do I mean by emotional dysregulation? I mean that moods are very variable. They change many times a day, up to four or five times a day. You have mood swings where people, children can be highly irritable, have temper tantrums, or even get so angry that they become verbally aggressive. And in this slide, you see what happens to the symptoms of ADHD during the lifespan. As I've already said to you, um, they are not static symptoms. You can see here uh, that there is a predominance of hyperactivity in the 
earlier years up to about age nine. And then during the teenage years, there's more distractibility and impulsivity also. So the predominant feature in adulthood is in fact the distractible, inattentive type. So this diagnosis of ADHD has been clearly defined and studied. It's been described since the last century. It's valid at all ages. We usually start treatment from five years, although there is some research on treating children younger than five. Often there are comorbid conditions, which means coexisting conditions that exist. For example, dyslexia, which someone mentioned in the chat, um, you know, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety disorders, sometimes depression, many sleep disorders, bedwetting, delayed sleep onset, altered performance on psychological tests. But this, the diagnostic criteria are clear. And the, as I said to you many times, it's neurodevelopmental. So what is required is that some symptoms are present before the age of 12. So we're talking about the onset of symptoms during primary school. And the course of this condition is persistent and chronic. A certain percent, about 40% of children will so-called outgrow their ADHD, but 60% will continue to have symptoms or a condition in adulthood. So there's a chronic disease burden and that means that because it lasts for many years, if it's not treated, you can adapt or maladapt, develop coping mechanisms that are in fact cause more problems for you. For example, listed here is rigidity or perfectionism. You know, if you're too rigid because you really don't want to be chaotic, that can in fact be disabling in and of itself. People with ADHD also tend to compensate, sometimes poorly, and all of this leads to increased burden, the disease burden. Okay, I'm going to use a few moments to talk about ADHD in girls because it's a neglected topic. Um, let's see the next slide, please. Good. Okay, historically, as I said, ADHD was described as, in fact, specific to boys. And if you look at the diagnostic manuals, uh, childhood ADHD fits boys much better than girls, and there's a limited number of studies in girls. Um, however, it does exist in girls. Let's have a ne next slide, Chantal. Okay, so are there more boys or girls with ADHD? Well, first, the answer to that question is it depends where you look. In community studies, where people are less intensely uh, dis dis disadvantaged or suffering from severe symptoms, there are three times as many boys as girls. But in clinical studies where people are coming for treatment, it's up to 10 times as many boys as girls. Okay, next slide. However, what happens in adulthood is that uh, there's the equal number of ADHD, women and men. So the problem is that in childhood and adolescence, girls with ADHD are often missed or misdiagnosed, as Chantal already told you. And Girls who present with inattention, disorganization, poor time management, and distractibility will be diagnosed more likely with depression and anxiety and not with ADHD. And this can be really problematic. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are three predominant presentation types. The commonest is the combined type. So most people have both ADHD, so they have the inattention and the hyperactivity impulsivity. But 10% have mostly inattentive, and they are more girls than boys. So they're more dreamy, absent, without the hyperactivity. Or they have some symptoms of hyperactivity, but not enough to make the diagnosis. And then there are those who are predominantly hyperactive impulsive. That's only 5% of people, and they do not have focusing or concentration issues. Okay. So what happens at the synapse? Oh, this is a bit of a pity, I think, because my animations are not going to come out. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is going to be a bit problematic. Chantal, press again. Okay, again. Yeah, again. Okay, go back then. That didn't work well. But uh, really, what I wanted to show you here, unfortunately, the slide did not come out well. But I wanted to show you that, um, that in the nervous system, the, the brain cells do not touch each other. Neurons do not touch each other. Between them, there is a space called a synapse. And in order for one nerve cell to communicate with the next nerve cell, at 
a, a signal means to travel down the nerve cell, and that is an electrical signal. But when it gets to the synapse, there's no way for the electricity to jump across the synapse, to jump across the empty space. So instead of that, you need a chemical messenger, which is what a neurotransmitter is. And in ADHD, what is involved is the particular neurotransmitter, dopamine. And basically what the slide is illustrating is how dopamine floats across the synapse, hits the second neuron, and that allows the chem electrical signal to continue moving down. And there's believed to be too little dopamine in certain brain areas in ADHD, and therefore the medications that we use increase the availability of dopamine in the space between the two neurons, and that's called the synapse. Okay, this was actually a little video for you, but unfortunately, uh, you've missed uh, sort of 80% of the slide. But I hope you understood what I was saying. Okay, next slide. I wanted to say one word about DIVA. Um, I'm also the editor of the DIVA Foundation. DIVA is a diagnostic interview for ADHD. Um, we have three versions of the DIVA. We have, uh, we have one for children and adolescents, one for adults, and one for people with intellectual disability. And we have translated the DIVA into 30 languages. So really a good and thorough diagnosis of ADHD should be available in many, many countries across the world. Okay, next slide. Just briefly to talk about treatment, because I see my time is running out. Um, treatment is a combination, ideally, of psychoeducation, so educating children and their parents about what ADHD is and what it isn't, providing emotional support for both parents and child, also to identify and diagnose comorbid conditions. So if there is coexisting anxiety or sleep disorder, you need to address that as well. And what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps you recognize faulty thinking patterns and to address them and to change your behavior. Okay, next slide. Okay, so primarily for treatment, we use what is called psychostimulants. These are medications that have been available since the 1950s. The most commonly known one is called Ritalin, um, and Ritalin comes as an immediate release formulation and a sustained release. Immediate release means you swallow it and it works almost immediately. Within three, four hours, you have the maximal effect, and then it stops working and disappears. And sustained release means that it takes a bit longer to start working, and it lasts for about eight to nine hours. There's some that last for longer, 12 hours. Um, there is another stimulant that is called dexamphetamine, and in some countries it's a stimulant called lisdexamphetamine as well, which is the most long-lasting. It lasts about 14 hours. So these are the types of psychostimulants. In some countries there are other types of stimulants, but um, for example, dexmethylphenidate, uh, but these are the main ones. And then there's another drug called atomoxetine, which is a non-stimulant, and that has got registration for children. Okay, I'm going to end by talking to you about the consequences of untreated ADHD. So in adults particularly, we see professional problems, we see financial problems, relationship problems, uh, difficulty with learning. So this is children at school. They might have coexisting learning problems, like as I've already mentioned, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Um, they might simply just attain a lower educational standard because they're not focusing well at school, they're getting distracted, or they are not doing their homework because it takes a huge amount of effort, or they're forgetting things at home or at school. Of course, if you treat these children, then a lot of these problems improve. In adults, we often see lower income for people who do not have untreated ADHD. There's a higher chance of suicide. There are lots of accidents, because of course you can imagine that when you're driving, you need to be well focused. So there are four times as many road accidents and other accidents, and arriving at the emergency room is increased in untreated ADHD too. 